Thank you, Lori. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Romans chapter 14. Romans, the book of Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in your New Testament. And then we come to Romans, uh, Acts and then Romans, I'm sorry. And uh, we will be talking chapter 14, verses 1 through 10. We'll really cover the whole chapter. But we've been talking about the book of Romans and the idea that we're more than conquerors because of what Christ has done. In the early parts of the book, we talked a lot about the gospel, about the sinfulness of humanity and ourselves, and how Christ overcame all of that with his death on the cross and his resurrection. We talked about the Holy Spirit and how he empowers us to live for Christ. We've talked about now, the last few weeks, about how to live that out, how to behave like a Christian, how to act like one in a world that's opposed to him. And today we're going to talk on the topic of liberty and limits. Because one thing we love about the Lord is He forgives us. That once we come to know Jesus Christ, we are in a relationship with Him that's never going to be broken. Uh, we call that eternal security. Sometimes they call it once saved, always saved. Sometimes we think that because He's going to love me and forgive me, I can get away with whatever. I can keep on sinning. I can keep on doing what I want to do. And he'll just have to keep loving me. Well, that's the wrong attitude to have, uh, as we'll see today. But also, the idea that we've also got to be aware that as we walk with Jesus, other people watch us. Other people are aware of us. The example we set, the testimony we profess... What they see of Christ in us, we have to be very aware of that as we go through life. So we're going to read chapter 14, and we're going to read the first 10 verses. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 10. And um, I've got the wrong verses on the screen, but it is 14, 1 through 10. And uh, uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Would you stand please for the reading of God's Word if it's comfortable for you? Um, this is kind of a long one again, so if you need to sit down during, we understand. Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose, and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these words. Burn them in our hearts, our minds, that we might obey you. Help us to shine your light wherever we go. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. Appreciate that. Now, we get into controversy sometimes with our brothers and sisters. In fact, right off the bat here in Romans 14, it starts talking about people who are vegetarian looking down on meat eaters and meat eaters looking down on vegetarians. In their culture and back then, there were some that because their conviction about idolatry and about paganism and all of that felt like they should not eat meat because idolatry was so much about sacrifices and offering these animals. You would go down to the butcher shops or the meat markets and some animals would have been offered to idols in false worship. And some Christians were wondering, should I eat that or not? And some said, 
be better just be a vegetarian. Others would get into like say the Jewish feasts and festivals. Do I still need to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and such things. And others would say we don't need to anymore and some would feel like they're holier than others because they celebrate and some feel they're holier because they don't. In our day and age, we've got some examples of this. For those of you from the Latin American culture, you're aware of the Dias de los Muertos, the Days of the Dead. And one of the best parts of the Days of the Dead, which occurs around the end of October, is that you make tamales in memory of your relatives who have passed on. And down in Mexico, I know for sure, because I, I lived with a family in Mexico for a few months, and they, they would actually put the tamales out. And whatever your relatives from the past, whatever they left, you could eat the next day. So you got the tamales, and then you'd make tamales for your neighbors and all that. And so Days of the Dead is just a great time to have tamales. And I'm, I'm real, you know, it's kind of like Santa, Santa Claus with his milk and cookies. You know, you set those things out there and, you know, it's probably not going to last till Santa gets there. I might get to him first. Same thing with the relatives' tamales. Other Christians would say, you know, leaving out tamales for your dead relatives, that's paganism. And others might say, there's no paganism in tamales. They're good all the time, right? We're always ready for tamales. Whatever the purpose might have been, we know this, as we read in our scripture reading this morning, all things are lawful for me. That means I've got the freedom in Jesus Christ to pretty much do as I see fit. I know there's sins I should avoid, but whether I choose to eat the tamale or not, and since it's in October, whether I choose to have an outreach on Halloween or not, because I know some people frown upon us doing trunk or treat, because we are out there on Halloween night trying to reach our neighborhood. Our thinking and my thinking is this. Number one, every day belongs to God. We just read that here. So there is no such thing as the devil's day. He doesn't have any. They all belong to God. Number two, it's a chance for us, since people are going to be out anyway, to reach out to them with the love of Christ and leave gospel tracts with them, maybe make a new friend. It's a great way for the neighborhood to know that our church is here and that it cares about them. So we do that. What's our reasoning for it? Just like he said, some people esteem a day and some don't. Whether you do or not, the day is the Lord's. To the Lord we esteem it or to the Lord we don't. That's up to us to decide. Regardless, as he says in verse 7, or verse 6 rather, we are the Lord's. None of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself. But through it all, we are the Lord's. In the Old Testament, there are three categories of Old Testament laws. And those three categories would include, number one, would be the ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws would be like the sacrifices and some of the cleansing rites you had to go through and things like that. Things that pretty much required a priest, required a tip, trip to the temple or the tabernacle, um, and required you to go through a ritual. We feel like all of that ceremonial law, as we see in the book of Hebrews and in other places, Jesus Christ, when he died for our sins, took care of all those sacrifices. Once for all, for everybody, Jesus did that. Then there's identification laws. These would be things like diet. You know, the Israelites were not supposed to eat pork. They were not supposed to eat bottom dwellers um, without scales like catfish. They were not supposed to eat shellfish. Um, several types of food. The reason it was like this was so that people would know by their diet that they were God's people. In the same way, things like the circumcision would identify them as Israelites. Other rituals such as what women had to go through when they had their monthly cycle and were not allowed to be part of the worship until they were through that period. Or if you touched a dead person. All these things were meant to identify you as God's people and your need for walking clean and holy in His sight. Again, I think in Acts chapter 10, where Peter has the vision of all those animals that are clean and unclean, and he's allowed to eat some of them. And God says, you know, you can eat any of them now. And, and I think that's the permission that a lot of this identification things, um, we don't have to worry. We can eat the catfish if we want to. We can eat the shrimp and the pork 
and the bacon. Ladies can come to church all they want to. And then we have a third area, which is what we're most familiar with, most of us, and that's the moral law. This is all the thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt have no other gods. This is all still good here. We obey those laws. When he says here, as we read in our scripture earlier, all things are lawful for me, but not everything is helpful. What he was saying is this. I don't really have to obey that ceremonial or identification laws too much more. That's not a big deal. Jesus Christ fulfilled all of that. I don't need to get caught up in arguments about it. If you want to go that route, and there are people today, they're called Messianic Christians. They really want to hang on to the Old Testament, and that's fine. And they want to have the festivals, and they want to do their worship in the style of the Old Testament and all of that, that's fine. But they are not first-class Christians any more than you are. Doing what they do doesn't make them a better Christian. Doing what we do doesn't make us a better one than them. That's what he's saying here. You follow your convictions as long as you know the Word of God that you're following it. Uh, but in these laws, we're primarily concerned with the moral ones. Now when we come to chapter 14 of Romans, and he's talking about living a Christian life, he now says, look, we've got freedom. And I know it's probably awful the way we treat our chickens before we turn them into nuggets. And it's not much of a life for being a cow or a steer when it's time for you to go to the slaughterhouse and become hamburger and steaks. But the reality is that's what we eat. And there are those who say, because of that, I can't touch it because I'm on the moral high ground. Well, again, that's between you and the Lord. How food gets processed, what you decide to eat, and again, the days you celebrate. But let's start learning to exercise principles for exercising our freedom, our liberty. The humidity affects everything, it seems like. There we go. All right. For exercising our liberty, let's remember, as we just mentioned, look at verse 7. None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. When you become a child of Jesus Christ, one truth is very clear. We are the Lord's. Whatever other decisions I make about my lifestyle, about my diet, about what holidays I celebrate and don't celebrate, whatever and when I look at other people and what they're doing and what they're not doing and what I think about it, I remember this. I am the Lord's. If they are Christians, they are the Lord's also. And it's really His job to work it out with them, not mine. Yes, this is a big passage about judging one another and about who really is doing the right thing on October 31st. You know, one of the big, big arguments people like to point out, what most Christians don't realize, and I say that sarcastically because we all realize it, but there's people out there, this is one of the great proofs against Christianity. Jesus Christ was not born on December 25th. And they're right, he probably wasn't. And we are commanded nowhere in the Bible to celebrate the birth of Christ. But boy, we sure like to, don't we? We dedicate a whole month to anticipating His coming. We call it Advent. No, we're not commanded to do it, but we do it. Why? In a way to remember what a glorious thing that God, the Son, left His throne, took on human flesh, born of the Virgin, and walked among us to bring us that salvation. So yeah, we celebrate it. We celebrate the fact that God came to earth. We celebrate the fact that He so loved the world that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish. Yeah, and Easter, um, and, and, and they talk about how Easter has its pagan origins and all of this stuff. Well, you know what? We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we put Bible verses in the eggs at our hag hunts where we're trying to communicate the gospel. We're trying to use these holidays to communicate God's Word. That's why we do it. Why? Because we are the Lord's. And every day of the calendar, every hour belongs to Him. 
And we have every right to celebrate every day and whatever else we feel God wants us to celebrate. We look around and realize that because we are the Lord's. Look at verse 9. To this end Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. He didn't die so he could be your friend. He didn't die so you could feel better. He died so he could be your Lord. Another word for that is master, savior. Yes, he helps you feel better. Yes, he loves you. But he died to buy you. He wants you in his family. He wants you for his. And his authority is the best authority you will ever find. We always talk about as Americans, we want our freedom. We want our liberty. Look, I am most free when I am under Christ's control. I am most free when I'm obeying him. Because I am, if I'm not obeying him, as we saw in Romans earlier, then I'm a slave to my own lusts. I'm a slave to my own desires. I would be either be a slave to Jesus than to myself. I would rather belong to him. I would rather have his authority helping me make this decision. Why? That we are the Lord's. And another reason was we exercise that liberty to remember it doesn't mean I can just do whatever I want because we face judgment. Wait a minute, Pastor. I thought as Christians we were saved and going to heaven. We are. Look, start in verse 10. Why do you judge your brother as to what they do, what they eat, what they celebrate? Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt? For we shall all... This is a Christian man, a missionary. We shall all, including himself and including you and me, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There are several spots in your New Testament where it's very clear that Christians, we will be judged. Not whether we're going to heaven or hell because the blood of Jesus, our relationship with Christ, we are going to heaven. But there's rewards. There's benefits. If you were with us in our Bible study on James last year, you'd have remembered, I like that James chapter 1 verse 12 a whole lot. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is completed, he shall receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those that love him. There are crowns and rewards. Look at the Revelation chapters 2 and 3 and see what happens to the Christians in the churches who overcome the sin and the evil in their life and the rewards God has for them. You will be judged by what you've done with the opportunities of this gospel, by what you've done with the resources God has given you, by what you have done with the opportunities He has given in your life. Yes, you as one of God's people... Are you just a pew sitter or are you someone that loves to serve Jesus Christ? Because I'm telling you, it's worth it. To be able to stand before Him and hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. To be able to stand before Him and say, You've got a crown of life. You endured temptation. You've got a crown of shepherding because you led a Sunday school class. You led those kids to Christ. You've got this reward because of your faithfulness. You died a martyr's death because you would not compromise. You did these things. Jesus Christ will remember. And in a way we can't even imagine a blessing from Him. Can you imagine Christ rewarding it? We're going to walk into heaven wondering how did I ever deserve this because I don't. And then here he is patting us on the back, hugging us and telling us this is for you because of what you did. We face judgment, but also we face judgment for what we didn't do. Okay? Not that he's going to kick you out, but I really don't want to stand before Christ empty-handed with nothing but a lot of uh, empty blanks there on my judgment list, if you will. Finally, we are commanded as we exercise our liberty. We need to remember we belong to the Lord. Secondly, we need to remember we will be judged on what we've done with that liberty. And finally, we're going to... <clears throat> Batteries are new. I swear they are. They're last week. Or maybe... There we go. Okay. Whoops. There we go. We are commanded. No stumbling blocks. Um... Each of us is going to give an account before God, it says in verse 12. 
He tells us in verse 13, Let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, to not put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Because see, I am free to eat those tamales on Halloween. I am free to hand out the trick-or-treat candy in the tracks and to meet our neighbors on Halloween. I am free to get up excited on Christmas morning because it's the day I remember our Lord came to the earth. But I also want to be aware that there's some people that because of their background, they may have a lot of trouble with that. I've talked to people who are, have been abused and they have a lot of trouble with the word Heavenly Father because of what their father did to them. They had lots of issues to work out. And so sometimes we didn't use the word Father so much as we used Savior. We used Lord. We used and, and helped them to understand that He's the perfect Father, not like your earthly Father at all. There are those who come out of a background that us celebrating these holidays may bother them a lot. Goodness sakes, the Jehovah Witnesses don't even want to salute the flag. They think that's idolatry. What do we do in those cases? In the cases where they're one of our brothers or sisters in Christ, we try to explain to them what's going on and why we do what we do. But we try to make sure we don't put a stumbling block in front of them. In other words, as it says in verse 13, or cause to fall in our brother's way. We don't want them to get discouraged and give up and think that we're like the rest of them. Let me let you in on a secret that most Baptist preachers aren't supposed to tell you. You do not go to hell for drinking a glass of wine. All right? Jesus went to a wedding and turned all the water into wine. It was not grape juice. Drinking wine will not get you in trouble with the Lord. Getting drunk will. Big difference there. All right? But there are people who come from an alcoholic background. Or maybe their parents were. And they really, I mean, if they took a sip of the stuff, it triggers them. And they've got to struggle with what, I, 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 I want to drink again. Well, that taste is in my mouth. That burning is in my throat. I want to drink again. And we don't want them to stumble. That's why we do grape juice. That really is the reason. Because we are a group of people that really try to reach out and get people to come to know Christ who have difficult backgrounds and maybe that alcohol might be a stumbling block to them. Others. The fact that you could keep sherry in the kitchen to cook with. It might bother them. But we've got to remember, you know, I, I do this at home. I do it where you're not seeing. So I'm not trying to put a stumbling block in your way. Limiting our liberty then. How do we limit it? How should we? We realize that not everyone has our convictions. In the passage here, and I hesitate to do this, I don't want to insult anybody, but what he talks about, like when he says the vegetarian ones, he calls them the weaker brothers. That the ones who are stumbling, they are weaker. What he means is probably more in the lines of less mature as a Christian, have not grown as much, Weaker in that sense, not inferior, but that they simply still have more to learn. Also, when we first come to know Christ, a lot of times we want to leave our sins in the past. And anything that's a temptation like that, boy, we want to stay away from it. So how do I limit my liberty? Number one, or A, I am going to be considerate of maturity levels. Look at verse 14. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus Christ there is nothing unclean of itself. I like my bacon. I like my catfish. I like my shrimp. Things the Old Testament told me I should not eat. But Paul says, I know that in and of itself those things aren't unclean. They're not sinful. They had another purpose, which we mentioned earlier about identification. Nothing is unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, if that wine bothers you, then yes, it's probably bad for you. If that pork, because of your cholesterol levels or whatever other reason, maybe you're just a kind-hearted soul that doesn't believe in eating animals. Well, there's nothing wrong with eating them, but there's also nothing wrong with not eating them. And so whoever considers it unclean, to him it's unclean. Yet if your brother is greed because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. 
If you're a vegetarian and I invite you over for a cookout, that's probably not a good idea. I need to make sure that I'm providing something for you at least. The idea here is this. When I look down my nose and say, Ah, you're a vegetarian. What's wrong with you? Or you don't like Halloween. Or you do like Halloween. What's wrong with you? I'm not walking in love. You've got that conviction. Maybe something happened in your past that makes you think celebrating that holiday, celebrating Days of the Dead, celebrating Christmas, man, I'm real uncomfortable with that. All right. You have the option to opt out of that. We also have the option of saying, okay, for your sake, we won't do it right now. For your sake, we'll provide salads. For your sake, we're not inviting you to the cookout. We'll invite you to something else, though, that you feel more comfortable with. We want to walk in love. That is the command here. That maybe some of our members are Republicans and some are Democrats. And we both look at each other and we say, how can you be Christian and belong to that party? Are we walking in love when we say that? We all may have our convictions about politics and about candidates, but we also need to continue to realize that nothing's unclean of itself, but you've got to figure that out. If your brother is grieved because of your politics, don't talk about it in front of them. Don't start arguments about how your side is better. That's not walking in love. you got 200 news stations that can do that for them. And let's face it, for most of us, arguing doesn't convince anybody. What we need to do is pray for each other. Pray for our country. Do not destroy with your food or your politics or your alcohol. Do not destroy, in verse 15, the one for whom Christ died. Don't discourage them so much saying, I can't go to that church. They all think that candidate is better. Because all they talk about is that candidate. When we come to church... We come to church not to talk about candidates, but to talk about who? Jesus Christ and what he's been doing. So if we're going to limit our liberty, we're doing it because we prioritize the kingdom. Look at verse 16. Do not let your good be evil spoken of. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not holidays. It's not politics. God's kingdom is what? It is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is what's important to us. That is what we're seeking after. We're seeking the Holy Spirit's power in our life. We're seeking the righteousness of God. We're seeking the joy that comes to Him. We don't have to have our own way. We drop down to verse 19. Let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we edify or build up each other. Instead of emphasizing our differences, let's say, well, look at what we've got in common in Jesus Christ. Let's exercise that and encourage the weaker. And again, that word weaker, the less mature, that they need to grow. Verse 20. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Y'all could get in an argument and say, you know, I've got no problem eating the tamales offered to the dead relatives. It's really messing that guy up though. Don't destroy their faith just over tamales. Don't destroy their faith over your convictions. Don't destroy their faith over politics. Encourage their faith by seeking that righteousness, joy, and peace. Verse 21, it's good. All things indeed are pure, it says in verse 20. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. I'll show you and I'll cut up my T-bone right in front of you if you're going to talk about your vegetarianism. That's the wrong attitude to have, isn't it? That's what he's saying. Uh, I'll, we've got to love each other enough to limit ourselves. Verse 21, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. If my opinions, some of my actions, and I'm here with the church body, and you know, the rest of us, oh, that's how pastor is, or that's how he or she is, but there's that new believer that's going, I can't believe they're doing that, saying that, acting that way. We've got to be aware of that. Yeah, I know you've been going to church for 20 years, but we need them also that just started last week. We want them in the fellowship also. 
We want them to know that we're about more than politics. We're about more than beef. We're about more than shrimp. We're about more than vegetables. We are about Jesus Christ. And that is our focus here. And whether political parties line up with what Jesus Christ is doing, that's another issue. But our focus is the kingdom of God. And we encourage the weaker that because, you know, you come out of a background that, man, Halloween is spooky to you. You know what? If you don't show up to help us on Trunk or Treat, that's okay. We don't mind that at all. We're just trying to reach other people with the gospel. We want to lift up in prayer and help them to see that as they grow, maybe their opinions will change, maybe they don't. But most of all, we want to see them keep following Jesus Christ. Because it's more important to me, despite who gets elected president in this country, that you folks keep following Jesus Christ. Politicians will not change America, but Christians following Jesus will. Whether I get to eat meat or not is not going to change anything, but my love for my brother and sister is going to change things. Whether I get a drink of wine or beer or whatever, I don't get drunk. I don't drink this stuff, by the way. I'm just saying it as an example. Relax. But whether you have one or two drinks or whatever, just relax. You know, as long as you're not doing that where somebody, one of the young people thinks, oh, that deacon drinks all the time, I can too. Ah, we got to be aware of that. We don't want to destroy their faith or your reputation over things like that. Why? Because we are the Lord's. That's the principle that's going to guide everything. Whether we wake or sleep, whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we are the Lord's. And as we serve Him, as we follow Him, we are aware of the fact that I represent Him. That my actions, my attitudes... And that's some pressure sometimes because, I mean, sometimes you just want to get around family and friends and let your hair down and laugh at jokes and have a good time. But boy, sometimes it's hard to remember, I'm always representing Christ. But if I'm madly in love with Him and holding on to Him 24-7, it becomes easier and easier. And realizing that, you know, not everything needs to be an issue. All things are lawful for me, but maybe not everything is helpful. I can vote for who I want to, who I feel is the best, but maybe ranting and raving on it in a Sunday school class isn't the best idea. Because we're about the kingdom. We're about Jesus. We're about following Him. Loving Him, worshiping Him, obeying Him. And in so doing, the younger generations, the newer Christians, get encouraged I can be like them. And they find out Christ is growing in them and they're turning into everything they dreamed they could be because of what Christ is doing. And the rest of us are encouraging them instead of tearing them down. That's what love is. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we need you. And there may be some here today that are really struggling with being a Christian because they think it includes all kinds of other stuff that they've got to do and be. And that's not really quite true. Help them to understand that first of all, all they really need is Jesus Christ. To know that He died for our sins, that He suffered our punishment on that cross and rose from the grave. And that believing that, we become one of Yours, Lord. We become part of Your family. So we pray for that to happen. We pray for them to grow as time goes by, that they will learn, that they will develop their own set of convictions, their own ideas, as they study your word, as they hear your word taught, as they follow you, as they hear from you, and as they pray, and they'll realize your way is truth. We pray for that, Lord. We pray for those of us who can be questionable at times, that we would realize what a responsibility we have to be an example to our brothers and sisters. To be what God has called us to be. We pray for all this in the name of your son Jesus. Amen.